would like to start now the second uh, session in this uh, webinar, which is anti uh, sorry, 2020 ACS guideline. I will start in this session, and then Dr. Hindal Zain, she will continue on the talk. So I have no disclosures. So I will go through briefly on definition of acute coronary syndrome and stable angina on in era of high sensitivity cardiac trombone. Sorry, Dr. Agrid, would you like to make any comment on Dr. Nadir talk or in that two case presentation? Sorry, I think it's we lost two for a few minutes. Can you hear us? I think your mic. Yes. yes, yes, I can. It's okay. I mean, it's, what's been said is quite very valid and very uh, comprehensive. So I think, uh, yeah, continue with the session. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I will just be uh, give a very, it's really a dry topic. I'm really sorry if my slide is, uh, is going to be very busy, but I will give brief talk about definition of acute coronary syndrome and unstable angina in era of high sensitivity cardiac trombonin. Diagnostic logarithm and triage in emergency department, rapid rule in uh, rule out logarithm, uh, risk assessment, as well as early management of uh, non histamine patient in light of recent guidelines. So the clinical presentation of acute coronary syndrome is really broad and it's strange from uh, complication like cardiac arrest, cardiogenic shocks, or patient presented with uh, acute valvular lesion like mitral regair, secondary to uh, myocardial infarction. And the main leading symptom to this dilemma, it is chest pain. Chest pain sometimes can be just tightness, can be epigastric pain, can be arm pain, or sometimes might be only breathlessness. And based on 12 lead ECG, we two diagnoses mainly will come. So STEMI and non STEMI. STEMI that patient with acute chest pain and persistent ST elevation more than 20 minutes. And this is mainly reflects uh, total occlusion or near occlusion to a coronary artery and the Ministry of Treatment in this situation, BCI or alternatively thrombolysis therapy in timely fashion. The second presentation, it is non STEMI, which is patient presenting with chest discomfort, but without persistent ST segment elevations. And sometimes we found patient without evidence of myocardial injury, like unstable angina, with uh, just only chest pain with minimal exertion. So, however, sometimes still we can see this kind of unstable patient in patient without the evidence of myocardial injury, I mean troponin, patient with recurrent or ongoing chest pain market ST segment depression on 12 lead ECG, heart failure, hemodynamically unstable, or patient with arrhythmia. And however, this kind of patient emergency or urgent cast lab should be sought. Based on this definition, uh, myocardial infarction also, sorry, I just lost the I have some difficulty. Yeah, sorry. Based on these definitions, we have we we always dealing with these five type of myocardial infarction. We have type one. Before we go to the, the classification of myocardial infarction, sorry, the definition also this definition also mainly raised on fall raised or fall in cardiac trombonin with the following uh, picture, which is symptom symptoms of myocardial ischemia, new ischemic ECG change. Development of pathological Q wave on the ECG or imaging, find the evidence of ischemia like regional motion normality. And finally, intra coronary thrombus detected on coronary angiogram. So, based on this definition, we have uh, from type 1 to type 5, we always hear about this in, the, in our daily uh, activity. So, type 1 is myocardial infection, secondary to uh, plague ruptures or atherosclerosis. This is a common type of MI we see from day to day. Type 2, it is myocardial infection to continue to increase oxygen demand or decrease supply. Well, there's a lot of you differential diagnosis for this. I will go through it in my next slide. Type 3, it is a post obesity or post-mortem examination diagnosis. Mainly, this is with the patient with presenting with cardiac arrest thought to be secondary to acute myocardial infection. Type 4 and type 5 is mainly related to revascularization. So the definition of unstable angina defined as myocardial ischemia at risk or minimal exertion in the absence of acute uh, cardiomyocyte injury or necrosis. So the presence of high sensitivity cardiac trombonin as say has led to significantly improved the diagnosis of non STEMI and had led to decrease the diagnosis of unstable angina. And overall, unstable angina does not carry high risk of this. Therefore, intensive antiblet antiblet therapy or invasive strategy for intervention within 72 hours is not recommended. 
So now moving on this uh, flow chart, which it should be applied to any patient presented to emergency department or chest pain unit. So initial assessment mainly based on integration of the low likelihood and high likelihood of feature, which is can be driven from these four clinical variants from uh, clinical assessment, mainly history and vital sign, 12 lead ECG, initial troponin at presentations and serial troponin thereafter. And based on these four variable factors, then we can try aggregation to rule in or rule out uh, allogris. So starting here from the very stroke, uh, patient presenting with focal localized chest pain who had a normal ECG, this is a patient very unlikely will have underlying myocard acute myocardial infarction, and therefore easy can be ruled out acute myocardial infarction, but again, there's an alternative diagnosis can be thought sometime emergency attention might need it. Simultaneously, if we compare this type of patient with the patient on the right side, high side patient with ST depressions with or other one with ST elevations, who had significant chest pain, widespread chest pain radiated to his both arm or neck, this kind of patient show does show clear feature of high likelihood of underlying acute myocardial infarction, and clearly ruled in should be at this kind of patient admitted direct to coronary care unit or monitoring bed. Down here in this uh, blue column here, just to make the final diagnosis, which is non-cardiac, that is when the diagnosis, alternative diagnosis has been sought, for example, like pulmonary embolism or pneumothorax or alternative differential diagnosis, or even patient can go home if he had like simple things like musculoskeletal chest pain or STEMI or non-STEMI, I think that this patient needs to be admitted to cardiac STEMI patient, which is clearly will go through a different route to the cast lab direct if we have the cast lab facilities. And sometimes there is a patient in between, like in the observational zone, still further troponin you might need it or further assessment might need it. And I will talk in that in my next few slides. History is very important as we do from day to day. It's, we, we might be able to reach diagnosis most of the time with good history. However, it's still clinical examination and assessment, proper test needed to confirm your diagnosis and again, examination mainly to make sure that you look on the vital sign to rule out any complications and uh, to check the hemodynamic status of the patients. The third part here in this diagram, which is 12 lead ECG. So the guideline clearly indicate that 12 lead ECG should be, I'm sorry, I have some problem in my slide. Yeah, the guideline state clearly patient presented to the emergency department, you should have 12 lead ECG in 10 minutes time or immediately with the first uh, paramedical contact outside of the hospital. And don't be surprised if we found that the uh, ECG normal in, in an STEMI patient as about more than 30% of the patients sometimes can have normal ECG. The ECG abnormality in an STEMI situation can be varied between transient ST depression, transient ST elevation less than 20 minutes T-wave elevation or ST depression. And always a, when the ECG inconclusive or patient had feature of right ventricular infarct, consider and think about additional lead. And good practice also to compare with the previous ECG if you had facilities of the ECG on your record. We used to get a lot of call and a lot of uh, the uh, opinion from the other world or from the outside of hospital with regard to bundle branch block, which is in general patient with left bundle branch block who had high clinical suspicions of underlying ischemia treat this patient as a STEMI, patient with left bundle branch block who is hemodynamically stable. I think the best thing to wait for cardiac troponin, as sometimes still you can apply other criteria, specific criteria, it's ECG criteria like sucrobosa criteria to rule out acute STEMI. In right bundle branch block, ST elevation most of the time indicate uh, that the patient had STEMI, and ST depression indicate non-STEMI. But overall, about 50% of the patient with left bundle branch block found to be have alternative diagnosis rather than acute MI. So the fourth column here in this diagram, which is uh, cardiac troponin, the biomarker overall is really, when we talk about biomarker in this guideline here, mainly we talk about high sensitivity cardiac troponin which is complemented to clinical assessment with 12 lead ECG and also can be able, we will be able to reach the risk stratification as well as uh, early uh, treatment of the patient suspected with acute coronary syndrome. 
So overall, the presence of high sensitivity cardiac troponin and C have a lead to higher negative protective value of myocardial infarction, and at the same time, lead to early detection of uh, type 1 myocardial infarction, as well as, I'm not sure this is a good thing, or so bad things also type 2 myocardial infarction has become more and more nowadays. The guideline also recommend after you do this flow chart in emergency department or in chest pain unit to go immediately and to do a uh, risk stratification. However, as just we mentioned earlier, this is a uh, if it does, which is all class 1B for history, assessment, ECG, laboratory tests like uh, trobonine, 12 lead ECG. So the recent guideline recommend that to use zero one hours algorithm with blood sampling. However, alternatively, you can use also zero hours and one hours as both has been classified as 1B. In addition to the kind of patient admitted to the emergency department for observation or for further test, still you can additionally apply third hours trobonine if the diagnosis is non-conclusive or if clinical condition is still not being, if the MI is still not being ruled out. This is just the evidence regarding what I said earlier. So this is the differential diagnosis of patient presenting with chest pain, which is very broad, which include cardiac cause, pulmonary cause, vascular cause, and gastroesophageal GIT conditions, and sometimes also orthopedic condition is wide, and I'm sure this everyone aware about this. This year, the condition other than acute type 1 myocardial infarction can associate with high cardiac troponin, which include tachyarrhythmia, heart failure, hypertensive emergency, and critical illness like shock patient, sepsis, myocarditis, tocosubo syndrome, valvular disease, aortic dissection, pulmonary embolism. So, immediately after we have the flow chart, then the guideline recommended also to use this diagram to highlight the two concepts. This is mainly the concept of the zero hours and one hours algorithm, as well as to look for any consequence of management of the patient presenting with non STEMI. So the zero hours, one hours high sensitivity cardiac troponin, if from the beginning is very low or low without change after one hours, then clearly this patient can be ruled out from the emergency department or from the ED. And, and alternatively, if the patient had high initial zero hours or after one hour troponin, result come back high or there's significant change that this patient can be ruled in. And in between, patient can be admitted for serotroponin or for further assessment by echocardiogram. And depending on this, you might be able to make your decision either discharge patient from the emergency department for further investigation like imaging test, stress testing, or anatomical test like coronary angiograph, or immediately admit, admit patient to intensive uh, to coronary care unit for invasive therapy by coronary angiogram. So the guideline also recommend to do risk assessment and I would come mainly to use uh, ECG criteria as well as biomarker clinical score for risk assessment, which is mainly GRIS score and bleeding risk score. So here in this slide, this is the, just the ECG, which is mainly it's not like qualitative marker, but which can be used as quantitative marker when we use the sum of the leads, which might indicate the extent of the ischemia correlated with the prognosis. And T wave inversion isolated is always did not carry any significant risk. This is here just from the slide website, from the website, from the European Society of Cardiology website, ECG, which I took it. So normal ECG, there is no clue about the significance. Patient with ST segment depression, mainly at G point, followed by horizontal or down slope ST depression. It does have a significance, which can indicate more severe ischemia. And transient ST elevation, less than 20 minutes, again, did not show any significant uh, prognosis. The D winter ST T wave or 
equivalent sign on the ECG it does carry significance, which is can indicate proximal LED occlusion or severe stenosis, as well as R wave on the ECG or uh, sorry, U wave or low QRS voltage can indicate high risk for in hospital mortality. So the, beyond the diagnostic significance of high sensitivity carbidoptonin, the guideline also uh, recommend that to use the initial cardiac troponin levels to add prognostic with regards to short and uh, long chair uh, mortality. This is, has been given class 1P. Uh, but from the card, high sensitivity cardiac troponin, also BMB or anti pro BMB should be considered, which is mainly to give clue about risk of death, acute heart failure, or development of atrial fibrillation. And this is the recommendation from the guideline, class 1B for troponin, 2A for anti pro BMB and did not recommend it to use alternative biomarker like CRP. So as soon as diagnosis is established, formally assess individual risk for future adverse cardiovascular, which is mainly guideline recommended to use GRACE score. This is a component of GRACE score, which include age, physical examination, ECG, blood test, and CLIP class of heart failure. So, Immediately after the result of the GRACE score, someone can use the sum of the point and then categorize the patient accordingly. So for example, for patient with GRACE score, total point of GRACE score more than 140, this indicates that the more, uh, hospital mort uh, in hospital mortality is 2.9. Therefore, the guideline indicate this patient should go for early invasive coronary angiogram in less than 24 hours. And Dr. Hinch will go through the invasive and non-invasive therapy. This is the recommendation for GRACE score to AB. Bleeding risk, the major bleeding risk has associated with uh, poor prognosis in non STEMI situation and the guideline recommended to use a few uh, score like for Corsair score or precise double therapy score or alternatively also you can use ARC high bleeding risk score. Here the major and minor criteria for high bleeding risk uh, according to ARC high bleeding risk score, which include patient already an anticoagulation therapy, severe renal failure, hemoglobin less than 11, spontaneous bleeding requiring hospitalization or transfusion in less than six months, moderate or severe baseline thrombocytopenia, all this available on the website guidelines. So it is just to highlight that there is calculation to use, which is ARCB high bleeding risk. And finally, I will be conclude my talk, and then I will give it. I will give the mic to him to continue the talk. So anticoagul anti anti thrombotic treatment. Now there is only kindly spoken about the anti thrombotic in a STEMI patient, but here is mainly anticoagulation anti platelet therapy in an STEMI patient, I'm really sorry, I have just difficulty today here with uh, my PowerPoint. So anyway, when we talk about this antithrombotic, we talk about anticoagulation drugs and antiplatelet therapy, which is mainly to targeting the thrombi and targeting the thrombus by the end. So this is mainly the risk between the antithrombotic treatment is mainly balanced between the risk and bleeding risk and ischemic risk, uh, which is depending on the intrinsic factor this is highlighted by green colors and the extrinsic factor, which is highlighted by yellow colors. So in immediately as soon as the diagnosis of non STEMI establish the guideline recommended to start with aspirin 300 milligrams as usual and continue with 75 milligram as well as the second anti platelet therapy, which is always P2Y12, as we know that from before. So what is the new in this guideline? This guideline is mainly, uh, the new in this guideline mainly with regard to the BRI treatment, which is defined as a strategy according to which anti platelet drug usually P2Y12 inhibitor are given before the coronary angiography and when the coronary anatomy unknown. This is what we use exactly to do prior to this guideline. However, uh, depend on the few trial, which one of them include uh, a cost trial and uh, SCAR registry and ISARA REACT 5, as just now the point to this one. The guideline has a slightly changed 
which he, a cost trial demonstrated that the lack of any ischemic benefit for pre-treatment in non-ischemic patient, but instead of that also, it does confer this very high bleeding risk with presocrial pre-treatment therapy. And I will go through it in my next slide. So here, this is the recommendation. So pre-treatment with B2, Y12 receptor inhibitor may be considered in patient with non histamine who are not planned to undergo an early invasive strategy and do not have high risk of bleeding. For those whose cath lab or in early invasive management is planned, the guideline did not recommend to administer routinely pre-treatment with a B2 Y12 receptor inhibitor. And that is, as I mentioned, just based on this three trial, there is a lack of evidence for pre-treatment benefit. There is lack of any ischemic uh, benefit. At the same time, there is the risk of bleeding if the patient had alternative diagnosis, for example, for aortic dissection. And also this medication work very quickly. So if we look on this slide here, yes. Yeah. So the mechanism of action of all these medication is, is very rapid. So for example, if you look on brisogrel and ticagrelor, both of them work between 30 minutes to four hours. And given that the guideline recommended do not use pre-treatment strategy for patient whose coronary autonomy is not known or an early invasive management is blunt. So just going back to uh, the first trial, which is this Scott trial, this is trial published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2013. And this trial is mainly evaluate the effect of administrating the B2 Y12 uh, antagonist at the time of diagnosis or after the coronary angiography, after the coronary angiogram, if the BCI was indicated. And in conclusion, the conclusion from this, this trial indicated that the pretreatment did not decrease risk of ischemia, but also it does show increased risk of major bleeding complication. So which antiplatelet therapy to give for in the CAS lab? Uh, the ISARA REACT-5 answer this question, which is presogrel should be considered in reference to Ticagrelor for non patient who proceed to PCI. So about from antiplatelet therapy, the guideline recommended also class 1A to use anti uh, parenteral anticoagulation, which is uh, mainly unfractionated uh, heparin. However, if the patient not going for cast lab or patient for medical therapy, then fundabar next the preferable. Okay, I'm sorry, I have some problem with my uh, slide today. Uh, at this point, I would like just to stop here and.